But today, I want to change your vocabulary. I want to walk you away from a thing called luck. And I'm going to give you a new word for some. Perhaps it's a new word, but it's, it's the right word. The word I want to talk to you about from the life of Joseph is a word pronounced Providence. You've heard it, Providence, Rhode Island. They came up with the word Providence for Rhode Island off of this word. Providence is a subset of another word. So let me give you the first word because Providence like comes underneath it. The second most important thing you need to know in your Christian experience the first important, the first thing you need to know in your Christian experience is the gospel. You need to know how to come to faith in Jesus Christ for your eternal destiny, for your salvation. That's the most important thing to know. But the second thing you need to know is about God's sovereignty. Sovereignty. First Timothy chapter 6 verse 15 says that God is sovereign. That is, he is the absolute ruler, controller, and sustainer of his creation. That's sovereignty. It's the ultimate ruler, the person who has the last say so, and here it is, nothing sits outside of God's sovereignty. There are no events over which he does not rule. There are no things. If it is created, he runs it. That's sovereignty, the ultimate ruler over all of his creation. Underneath sovereignty is a word that couples with it, and that's the word providence. Providence is the way God arranges things to achieve his sovereign purposes. Sovereignty is his rulership. Providence is how he hooks things up, integrates things, connects things, detaches things, arranges things in order to wind up at the sovereign goal to which he is moving. So providence is the arrangement that facilitates sovereignty. The Bible is clear that our God is sovereign and that he does all things, Ephesians 1 verse 11, after the counsel of his own will. That his purposes can never be thwarted. The scripture is clear that he is ruler over all. He's sovereign. Now here it is. You cannot simultaneously have sovereignty and luck. The two can never coexist. Because luck is random events that occur that shape things. But if you have a sovereign God who controls everything, you can't have random events that shape anything. So you can't have sovereignty and, you, and luck. You can't have both. And the way God works out what you and I might call luck is through providence. That is, arranging things so that they come together or disconnect as he so chooses. So I want you to begin to moonwalk from luck. And begin to make your way toward providence. We have watched Joseph's life and it is filled with ups and downs. He's, a, he's in a coat one day, he's in a pit the next day. He's got a good job one day, he's accused of rape the next day. He's in prison, he's forgotten, he's remembered. I mean, this guy is going through stuff. It looks like one day he's, uh, one, one day he's got good luck, the next day he's got bad luck. But look at how Joseph looked at his life in verse 19 and 20. But Joseph said to them, do not be afraid, 
for I am in God's place. As for you, you meant to evil against me, but God meant it for good in order to bring about this present result to preserve many people alive. You know what he just said? God did this on purpose. What looked like an unlucky day and a lucky day was God fulfilling his purpose to bring me to my destiny. If you ever get providence, the subset of sovereignty, and move away from luck, you will begin to view life differently. Sovereignty must be the foundation and his providential working, we'll talk about that, by which you now begin to live and look at the events that shape your life so that you can arrive at your divinely ordained destiny. But if you start with the foundation that God is sovereign and that he providentially arranges things to accomplish his goal, you have laid a foundation through which to look at the complexities of life that comes your way. What you and I and others may look at as random events are actually orchestrated events in the purpose and plan of God. Let's put it another way. This mysterious thing called providence means God is sitting behind the steering wheel of history. And sometimes he's on the main highway, other times he's driving down back alleys. Sometimes it looks like he's going the wrong way on a one-way street. But he's steering the steering wheel of history to arrive at a destination. Now let, let's get this straight. Sovereignty and his providence, how he hooks things up, is not merely related to the big things that happen. See, we look at the big things and, and we say, well, either God was in it or God wasn't in it because it was a big, because it affected me greatly. Sovereignty is so complete and providence is so intricate that God includes the details. That's why Matthew 10 says that God knows every hair that's on your head and when it comes out. And he says he knows every sparrow that falls out of a tree. So when we talk about the sovereign providence of God, we're talking about not only that he controls the big things that get our undivided attention, but the little things we don't think twice about. Now I know you like to think the devil is in the details, but God says I'm in the details. Because sovereignty covers everything and providence is how he hooks the everything up in order to arrive at his specific purpose. Because God is sovereign, he is never caught by surprise and he never says, oops, that one got away from me. He doesn't do that. Because if he's controlling the big and the little, that means he's not surprised by anything. What shocks you was long known by him. So here is the word. The word is providence. God arranging things. So let me help you right now about providence. The Bible says in Romans chapter 11 verse 33, God says that his ways are unsearchable. You can't Google his providence. You cannot sit at your computer and Google God's ways and get the intricate details of how he does what he does because it is past finding out. So don't be surprised when God doesn't make sense. He's not supposed to. Because his ways are not our ways and his thoughts are not our thoughts and they're not even close. As high as the heavens are above the earth, Isaiah 55 says, so is the gap between God's thinking and God's, our thinking, God's ways and our ways. And you cannot 
Fig he is the unfigureoutable God. The only things you can figure out is what he decides to tell you. And Deuteronomy 29, 29 says he doesn't tell you everything. Now watch this. He says in verse 20, as for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good. Oh, oh, oh please stick with that word meant. They did, his brothers, his family, did evil against him. And he says, and you meant it for evil. You messed my, up my life on purpose. You planned to sell me as a slave. You planned to tell my daddy I was killed by an animal. You, you planned to ruin my life. Anybody in here where somebody planned to mess you up? I mean, they, they pre-planned that thing. They thought about that thing. He says, as for you, you meant it for evil. But then he uses the word meant again. But God meant it for good. Providence includes good and bad. God is sovereign. Nothing happens outside of his rule. But within God's sovereignty, he created freedom. Freedom means you get to choose. There's no freedom without choice. You're free to say yes or no, to go or stay. God created freedom, but he's also sovereign. So how can he be sovereign and control everything and at the same time create freedom? Because freedom means I can do good or bad. I can be righteous or unrighteous. I can be evil or not. We've all done both because we are free. God is sovereign. He's created boundaries. But he's also created freedom. That freedom allows you to do bad or good, to be right or wrong. But he limits how free he lets free go. Because when you step on his line, when you step on the line, the whistle blows. So God keeps his sovereignty while allowing freedom. Now watch this. Because God is sovereign in his providential connecting of things, he either causes all things that happen or allows them to happen if he didn't cause it. God cannot sin. God cannot endorse sin. But what he will do is use it. He cannot do evil but he will use evil to accomplish his purposes. Because Joseph says, you meant it for evil, but God meant it, the it that you meant for evil. He meant it for good. Let's put it another way. God used your mess in my life to bring me to this location. It's because you messed over me. I'm fulfilling my destiny. It's because you were trying to do me in. I'm in God's place. See, when you got a sovereign God like that, who can take folk messing over you to bring you to where he wants you, you don't want to hang out with luck. You want to hang out with providence. Because providence is how he arranges it for it to happen. Look, God is so good at his providential work of hooking stuff up and arranging stuff in order to accomplish his sovereign purposes. Luke 22, Jesus told Peter, the devil has asked permission to mess up your life, to sift you like wheat, and permission has been granted. So the devil is not just the devil, the devil is God's devil. Because even he only gets to be a good devil by permission. That's how sovereign God is. The devil doesn't even get to be good at his job without a divine okay. I know that's messing with you. But, but we've got to deal with the fact that God is sovereign. He says, you meant it for evil. You were out to get me. But God used that thing to bring me to this location. And when you're dealing with the providence of God, watch this now, you never see all there is. 
You never see all that's taking place. You never see all the details that God is working out behind the scenes. In fact, what you do see often doesn't connect. There are parts that don't seem to relate to one another. That's because God is always doing more than one thing at a time. He's dealing with 50 million things at the same time. That's what makes him such a unique being. He can take billions of people at the same time and connect everything in order to accomplish our purpose and his destiny in our lives. And he's doing it all at the same time. But because we can't see it, Sometimes it doesn't look like he's doing a thing. Sometimes it looks like he's asleep. Sometimes it looks like the phone is busy. Sometimes it looks like he's on vacation. That's because all you see is what you see. And if all you see is what you see, you do not see all there is to be seen. He says, you meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. In order to accomplish his purposes... Don't think that the king of kings and lord of lords and the sovereign of the universe can't run over a situation that gets in his way. And as long as you have a sovereign God who controls providential activity, that means the people, the problems, and the circumstances in your life don't have the last word. Because God can run over anything that gets in his way. His position demands it. Providence, the sovereign hand of God, ruling and overruling all things. You meant it for evil. But the idea here is that God in his providential working takes good and bad to bring about, I like this, the present result. What is his present result? This man has reached his destiny. He's in the place God was taking him all the time. It, take, it took him 22 years to get here. When we started, he was 17. This is 22 years later. So it took him 22 years to arrive at this spot. Because we don't arrive at our destiny overnight. Very few people arrive there. It depends on what God's purposes are and whether we're cooperating or contradicting those purposes. Whether we're walking with him or walking against him, which can affect the delay or the development of, of our destiny. Our goal through this series is for everybody to end your life having reached your destiny. Even if it meant evil had to be used to get you there. Now, I know some of you are thinking, well, what if you're the one that did the evil? That's another sermon for another day. But God never endorses it, but he does use it. Here's the goal of God's providence. You know the scripture well. Romans 8, 28. All things work together for good to them who love God and who are called according to his purposes. All things work together for good to those who love God and are called according to his purposes. God's goal in our destiny is always his glory and our good. God is the master weaver. And things are rarely as they appear. You have to know that. Well, there's a statement in this story. I, I love this statement. Jacob, Jake, Joseph's father, he says this. He thinks Joseph is dead. Benjamin, his son, is, is being held hostage by Joseph, for those who've read the story. They're getting ready to lose Simeon. They're hungry because there's a famine in the land. And, and Jacob did like many of us when everything is going wrong. He threw up his hands and said, all these things are against me. You ever felt like that? Nothing's right. Everything's wrong. And what's broke is gets broker. Just everything is just wrong. He says, all these things are against me. Little did he know. Joseph was fine. Prince in Egypt. Benjamin was fine. Joseph taking care of him. Simeon was going to be fine and they were all getting ready to go up to Egypt to eat because you never see all that God is doing when you're looking at it. You only see that peace that he wants to show you right now 
You say, why won't you show me the whole thing? So that you learn to walk by faith and not by sight. So that you and I learn to walk by faith and not by sight. We, we had a, a cruise to Alaska. It was a cruise, uh, the urban alternative, our national ministry, we had a cruise for our donors and we went to Alaska. A number of years ago, we went to Alaska and, and on our way back, the captain said, we're gonna hit a storm. The captain said, we're gonna hit a storm and it might be, might be a rough storm. And boy, was it a rough storm. Because we were in a storm and it was dark outside. Sister Evans, picked up the telephone and said, I want to speak to the captain. I sat on the side of the bed and went, oh Lord. She said, I want to speak to the captain. The lady said, the captain cannot come right now. We're trying to weather this storm. He cannot come right now. I'm so sorry because, you know, this is turbulent, so we cannot come right now. She said, well, I just want to know. He told us, he knew we were going to go into the storm. He could have gone through the inside passage and bypassed being directly out in the open ocean in the storm and we could have bypassed a lot of the storm. That was an option. But he didn't take the inside passage. He took us and we have 200 guests on the boat and they're having this miserable experience because the captain didn't go the safer, smoother route. He took the, and I want to know why he would do that and give us this much discomfort. The lady said, well, I'll relay the message to the captain, but he can't come to the phone right now. This is a serious situation we're in. So the phone was hung up. I took a deep breath. <laughs> a few minutes later, the phone rang. And it was the assistant to the captain. And the assistant to the captain told Sister Evans, Sister Captain said, um, this is rough and I know it's bad, but you need to understand one thing. This ship was built with this storm in mind. When we were in dry dock and we were putting this baby together, we knew we would hit a day like this. We knew we would hit a day when, when there would be all the world would collapse and there would be a storm like this and all of that was taken into consideration before we ever launched. So even though it's uncomfortable and even though it's difficult, I just want you to know that you're going to reach your destination safely. Even though it's difficult sailing right now because of what was built here and because of who's in charge here, we're going to get you from where we took you back to where you came from and you're going to get there safely. You may be on rough seas right now. You may be in turbulence right now. It may be dark right now. But your trial is on a ship that was built with this trial in mind. Because you've got a captain who knows how to weather the storm. You've got a captain who knows how to guide the ship. And you've got a captain who knows how to deliver you to your destination safely. Because even though the storm may mean it for bad, God means it for good to all who love him and who are called to his purpose. So leave luck alone. Get you some providence so you can have confidence in the circumstances of life. Well, I hope you're enjoying uh, this series on the meaning of Christmas as much as I am. I, uh, it was exciting just to be reminded myself in preparation about uh, why this holiday is so special, why it's so critical, why it's so misunderstood, and why it needs to be much more deeply appreciated by those of us who, uh, who celebrate it, by those who do not understand it, so that we can help clarify what this holiday is all about. This is session number three. We talked about the person of Christmas, that is the unique person, Jesus Christ, the God-man. We've talked about the purpose of Christmas. It really is God becoming man to deal with the problem, the problem of sin that needs to be addressed for all humanity. And in fact, if you've missed the first two parts, if you've missed the first two uh, lessons, uh, you can get this whole series, all four parts, uh, simply by contacting us here at The Urban Alternative. We'd be glad to get the whole thing to you so that you can have 
Christmas in perspective, a biblical perspective based on the word of God. Talk about perspectives. Today, I want to look at some different perspectives of different people who were uh, who were involved with Christmas. Uh, you know, we, we're, we're big at our house during Christmas on uh, on wrapping gifts. I really have never understood gift wrapping <laughs> because you make it pretty to make it ugly again. I mean, you, you go in and you, you're tearing the paper, tearing it all apart, and it just economically challenges me <laughs> to buy paper and wrap to tear it up. But uh, in addition to the, uh, the paper that's torn up, we, we have some other gift wrappings at our house that sit outside. When you walk up to our front door, there are these beautiful, well-wrapped gift boxes as you enter the home. Now, the problem with those gift boxes is that they are empty. <laughs> okay? Uh, there's nothing inside, although it looks pretty. That's a lot of what Christmas is for a lot of folk. It's well-wrapped emptiness. Many people find Christmas to be a depressing time. The loneliness, the loss of a loved one, uh, uh, family breakdown, or families have to be disseminated. And so they do other things to gift it up, even though they may be hollow on the inside. And when you do not understand the true meaning of Christmas. You can make it pretty, but it's hollow inside because its true meaning is missing. When there was the first Christmas, we see a number of people involved in this occasion. Of course, we know Joseph and Mary were involved. Uh, Joseph, being a righteous man, uh, did not uh, put his... Uh, a wife to be on display given her pregnancy that he had absolutely nothing to do with, which I'm sure it took a lot of faith on his part. Yes. Okay? How can this thing be? Mary asked it, but I'm sure he had some questions too before the angel clarified how exactly this took place. But we're introduced in chapter 2 of Matthew to some other uh, personalities. The first personality whose perspective I want to give you and we'll, we'll come back to this first one again, but it says, After Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, Magi, we call them the wise men from the east, arrived in Jerusalem saying, Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we saw his star in the east and have come to worship him. Here we have a group of Magi. We don't know how many they were. I know tradition has it as three, simply because they gave three gifts. So that's why you typically see uh, three. But you're going to have multiple people bringing uh, uh, the same gift. So, so we don't know how many they were. But one thing is clear. They came to worship him from a long way away. Their perspective was Jesus was worth the worship and Jesus was worth the inconvenience to get to worship. These men, when they came to worship Jesus, took an extremely long time to get there to him. Because when they arrived to Jesus, he's a child, not a baby in a manger. So they see his star, his star, not merely a star, his star. Uh, you might call it, to use Old Testament terminology, Shekinah glory, a unique divine presence in the sky. That means that they had looked at the prophecies concerning Jesus as being the revelation of God and decided this child was worthy of worship. But by the time they arrived there, he's a child in a house, not a baby in a manger. It says later on in chapter two, when they reached the house and saw the child. Which means that if they initiated their movement to Jesus when they saw the star of his birth, but didn't arrive till he was a child, and the Greek word there means toddler, that means this could have been a one to a two year journey by horse or caravan coming from the Oriental East to the Middle East. 
They aren't flying planes. They aren't traveling at supersonic speed. But they decided that this child was worth this journey. That's hard to get some folk to drive 20 minutes today. Uh, they'll go to a party but not have time for a worship service because they don't have the right perspective on Christmas. They will spend a lot of time enjoying the celebrations, maybe, maybe a minute or two, reflecting on the real reason for the holiday. Not these wise men, not these men who took this journey because they decided this child is worth my worship. So the question you have to ask is, does Christmas invoke worship in your life? Or is it just another holiday where Jesus' name is thrown around? These wise men sought him. And because they sought him, after they found him, it says God revealed himself to them. Because chapter 2 says, they were warned by God in a dream not to return to Herod and the Magi left for their own country another way. Guess what they got because they had a divine focus on Christmas? They got divine guidance. They got a warning and a new direction. People in life need guidance. They need to know how to make decisions, how to move the right way. The Magi, the wise men, found guidance in their worship of Jesus Christ at Christmas. Now, Christmas precedes the new year. The new year is assumed to be new beginnings. It's a time for New Year's resolutions. It's a time when people are planning to how they're going to flow for the next 12 months. So it's a great time to hear from God on divine guidance. But they got divine guidance in their worship, not in the opening their Christmas gifts not in their parties, not in their celebrations. It was in their worship of Jesus Christ, the Son, where they got guidance from the living and true God. So as you approach this Christmas, if you need to hear from God and you need direction for your life, maybe you ought to spend uh, a, less, a little less time at the party and a little bit more time in the worship so that as you approach the new year, you can get a word from God about the direction of your life about warnings, ways you shouldn't go, situations you shouldn't be in because God guides you another way. They got guidance because they had worship. Wise men still seek him during Christmas. Why? Because God is there when Jesus is being glorified and when Jesus is being worshiped. So this first group, the wise men, went through great convenience to get to where Jesus was and they got to hear from heaven because of it. Now we have another person who shows up whose perspective uh, is important for Christmas. It says, when Herod the king, chapter 2 verse 3 says, heard this, he was troubled and all of Jerusalem with him. When Herod, <laughs> the king, heard this, what exactly did he hear? He heard what the Magi were looking for. Right. Where is the king of the Jews that we might worship him? And when Herod got shook up, it says all of Jerusalem got shook up with him. Why? Because if you make Herod mad, you're in trouble. And Herod was shook up. He was destabilized. What was it about what the Magi was looking for that messed up Herod? It was that the Magi was looking for another king. And Herod was the king. And Herod's perspective is, we'll have room for two kings. I'm the king here. So when you come looking for this other king you're talking about, we have issues. And if I Herod have an issue... Y'all over who I'm ruling, y'all have an issue too. Because I'm upset, you better be upset. Because you're in trouble, because I'm in trouble. Because we got these folk looking for another king. Jesus Christ has always had problems 
with people who don't want his rule in their life and in their world. We want a savior we can rule over, not a savior who rules over us. Herod was upset because there were going to be too many kings in Jerusalem. He would be the king of the Jews and he would be worshipped as a king and as the living and true God. So the second person we have here is a person who brought trouble to the rule of man by bringing the rule of God. So here's the question you've got to ask from this lesson of Herod. We've already looked at the wise men. He's worthy of worship at Christmas because this was during the time of his birth, even if it's inconvenient for me. But does he have the right to be king over your life? Does he have the right for you to submit your rulership to his authority? Does he have final say so in your life? Or do you want to keep him at bay because you don't want his rule, his decision making power? And watch this. Are other people negatively affected because you do not allow him lordship? I'd like to suggest to you that a lot of other folk are in trouble because we're in trouble with Jesus being king. When a man says Jesus can't be king over my life, his family may be in trouble. His kids could be in trouble. The order in his home could be in trouble. When a society says we don't want Jesus and his principles ruling here, that nation could be in trouble. In fact, you can have churches that are in trouble because the pastor won't even let Jesus rule in the house of God. This was true in the Old Testament. They carried on their worship without the rulership of the living God. And so there was disorder. The Bible says when there was no true God, that there was disharmony in the culture. So the unraveling of lives, families, churches, even the whole of society can be simply because we don't want this king ruling over our lives. And that trouble brings trouble for us. So we see the wise men worthy of worship. We see Herod. We don't have room here for another king. I want to be ruler of my own life, captain of my own ship, master of my own fate. So we'll, we'll carry on the celebration. Uh, notice what Herod's statement was. He says, Gather together all the chief priests and the scribes. He inquired of them where Messiah would be born. He wanted to know where Messiah would be born. And he wanted the Magi to tell him. He said, uh, when you have found him in verse 8, report it to me so I too may come and worship him. Now he had the right words. He was talking... We would call it talking smack. He was talking noise. He used the words of Christmas without the worship of Christmas. He had the rapping, but there was an emptiness hollow inside because he didn't mean it. He was utilizing it without meaning it. That's what happens today. We have the language of Christmas, the songs of Christmas, the celebration of Christmas, the programs of Christmas, the activity of Christmas, and it's well wrapped without the meaning of Christmas because people have the wrong perspective about Christmas because they don't want Jesus to rule. They want to keep him in a manger. They want to keep him cute and pretty. They don't want to deal with why Christmas exists. But there's a third group. It says he calls the scribes and the Pharisees or the chief priest and he says, I want you to get this information. Where is this Jesus to be born? Where is this king to be born? So he calls the religious leadership and the religious leadership tells him what had been written. Verse 6, and you Bethlehem land of Judah, you know only means the least of the leaders of Judah, but out of you shall come forth a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Interesting. He calls religious leaders and the religious leaders quote 
scripture. That means they know their Bible. So the one who didn't want Jesus to be king calls the religious leaders and say, tell me where he is to be born. And they give him impeccable information. But we have something missing here. While they knew the Bible, they never made the trip. While they knew the word, they never went a few miles down the street because Bethlehem is right down the street. They had studied the scripture but didn't do what the wise men did, go to worship the Lord. Which means you can have religion attached to Christmas without relationship attached to Christmas. You can know the Bible and not know the Lord. You can sing the songs and not know the Savior. You can celebrate the occasion without experiencing the relationship. Jesus spoke of such a, a, a mindset in, in St. John, the fourth gospel. And he says this in chapter five. He tells them that, that they had the word and they studied the scriptures, but they did not know the Lord. He tells them that you search the scriptures, verse 39, because you think in them you have eternal life. It is in these who testify of me, but you're unwilling to come to me. You know the scriptures, but you don't come to me. The religious leaders knew the scriptures, but they didn't go to Jerusalem. If the scriptures don't lead you to Jesus, then you've got a well-wrapped holiday because you're reading the Bible, you're quoting the verses, but you're not drawn to the Savior. This Christmas season will be full of religious activities. Jesus will get a little play. He'll get a little, they'll, they'll quote about him, talk about him, mention him, recognize him, throw out his name. But we will be living in the midst of a well-wrapped culture who won't come to him. If what you read about him doesn't draw you to him, you don't experience him. So as you interact with yourself and others during this holiday season, you don't want to be like Herod, reject his rule. You don't want to be like the religious le leaders, read his word, know his word, be able to quote his word. No, you want to be like the wise men who didn't have all the biblical information because they were, they were searching, where is he? So they, they, didn't have all the, they, they didn't have all the exegesis and they didn't have all the theology. And they didn't have all that, but they were looking for him. And the Bible says, if you look for me, you'll find me when you search for me with all of your heart. So don't let religion keep you from